Welcome to What the Ish. I'm your host, Patricia San Pedro. Joining us today is Louis Aguirre, news anchor on ABC in Miami, actor and environmentalist. He's done it all from being a correspondent on shows such as Extra, The Insider, and Deco Drive, to acting in Sex in the City, Burn Notice, and soaps, including Guiding Light and All My Children. Louis reached for the stars, grabbed them, only to find that his true fulfillment was back home in Miami, covering environmental issues that have a real impact on all our lives. Today, it's all about finding what truly fulfills you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to What the Ish. I am so happy today to be chatting with Louis Aguirre, someone I've known for a long time through a lot of different entities, right? Yeah, we go back a long time. <laughs> Throughout our career. Louis, yeah. thank you for joining us um, today. I'm really happy that, um, that you're going to be a part of this. Oh, it's so my pleasure to be here with you today. So here's what I would love you to share. Um, okay. I would love for you to talk about your story uh, of how you worked most of your professional career to, to get to Hollywood, really only to find out that it wasn't all that it was cracked up to be, which, uh, which led you to discover a part of you that had an ish. And that's our podcast. It's all about the ish. And I think this ish for you was that you thought you were doing all that you were meant to do ish until you realized you were meant to do more and that the right. universe had a perfect plan in place. Did I say that right? Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. That's absolutely 100% correct. And I think the ish follows us throughout life. From the time that we uh, become conscious of ourselves and of our humanity and our three-dimensional world that we're living in. And, um, and we want to manifest things uh, to happen. We have dreams, we have goals, we have ambitions. And uh, I think that evolves over time. And from the time that I was little, I knew that I wanted to be in front of the camera. I didn't know what that meant. Uh, I knew that I loved animals and I loved and admired Jacques Cousteau and Marlon Perkins. Um, and uh, I admired a lot of the actors that I grew up watching. Back in the day, I was a big $6 million man fan and a big fan of the Times of the Apes. And I thought, boy, that would be fun to play make-believe. Um, but I also was very inspired by the great storytellers, the uh, Walter Cronkites and the Peter Jennings. And so um, I kind of ished my way throughout high school, not knowing where I was going to go, what direction I was going to be in. I just knew that I was a communicator. I knew that because I excelled English and I excelled at public speaking. And so I knew um, that I think life kind of uh, guides us towards our strengths and uh, exposes our talents at a very raw and young age. And then we cultivate them growing up. So I thought I wanted to be an actor. My parents were like, no, we didn't, we didn't give you six years in Berlin for you to go and be an actor somewhere. So I, I thought, well, okay, how do I channel this? And I thought, well, maybe news is the way to go. And so I, I dedicated myself to becoming a journalist and learning how to do uh, not just television, but to write and to accurately uh, to accurately tell stories that were happening every day. And so um, I, I channeled my energies into doing that. And I first uh, began my career doing local news and the pressure of having to crank out these stories every day um, that weren't always so enriching and weren't always lifting me up, uh, taking home the crime, the sadness, the just the, the darkness of covering news in this town. I'm talking about you know, the 90s. And Miami is a crazy news town. We have uh, international news, local news, and national news happening 24-7 here. Um, it was very hard for me at a young age to be able to, to, to deal with that and reconcile that. And so, um, Sure enough, um, after my meteoric rise at Channel 10, and uh, I was offered my first job in Hollywood, so I went to uh, work for a show called Extra, which is a brand new uh, entertainment show that was uh, going head-to-head -head against Entertainment Tonight. And I thought, oh, that's it. I'm, I'm here. I'm in Hollywood. Okay, now it's time to make my dreams come true. And I got there, and it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And um, it was 
uh, a real cold glass of water in my face, thinking that, okay, I had arrived and all of a sudden, everything that I wanted to manifest when I was a kid was going to start to happen for me. And it didn't. The job was not great. My executive producer was not a fan, even though I was hired by the network to work on that show. And six months into my gig, I was taken off the show. They still had to pay me. And but then it became about recalibrating and wondering what I was going to do with the rest of my life. You know, again, the, the, the winds of the universe came to play. They, they blew me to New York City, where I worked for a show called The Current Affair. When that show went away, I was hired by Fox News Channel. And I thought, okay, well, now I'm anchoring a local, I mean, I'm anchoring a national morning newscast, you know, and I'm making a lot of money. I'm in New York City. This is it. I'm at the pinnacle of my career, mm -hmm. only to discover two years into it. It's like, I don't like this job. I don't like what I'm saying. I don't like the person who I am on the show. And sure enough, I made the decision that I didn't want to do that anymore. And then when I made that decision internally, then all of a sudden, all these doors and windows started opening up for me. I was offered jobs on soap operas. I got offered a job on Sex in the City. I had no idea what that show was. I thought <laughs> I was going to have to explain to my mom that I was doing softcore porn on HBO. And then oh little did I know. <laughs> I was on the most popular TV show ever created. Oh. Um, so all of these. She didn't know that. She didn't know that series. She didn't wasn't aware. Well, no, because it? it had just started. So, so oh. I shot my episode of Sex in the City when the first series was was when the first season was just beginning to air. And you know, you're doing a show called Sex in the City. I was like, oh, okay, you know. And at that time, you know, you had Skinamax, you had Red Shoe Diaries on Showtime, and I'd seen those shows. Like, okay, mm -hmm. I guess I'm gonna be, I mean, in my in my scene on on the script, there was no nudity, but you know, you don't know the direction maybe these shows are going to take. So. I'm like, okay, here we go. But I was so anxious or so excited to get my, my acting career started that I was going to take this gig no matter what. You know, obviously Sarah Jessica Parker knew who she was and I knew who Kim Cattrall was, but I didn't know what the show was. And um, boy, was that a ride. And I've been very proud of the uh, 90 seconds I had on screen to be a part of that show. That legacy was a pretty big deal. So um, I, I thought things were going well for me. And then we had the actress strike of the year 2000. And all of a sudden I stopped working. I was living in New York City, one of the most expensive cities in the world. And um, and and in all of this, I met my partner, who I'm with now 21 years later, Matt McDonald. And he was living in Miami and we were commuting back and forth, Miami, New York, Miami, New York. And my agent called me one day and said, there's a show in Miami that really wants you. It's a show called Deco Drive. And oh yeah, I've heard of that show. I, said, I don't know if I want to go back and do local, but Matt was in Miami and the show was in Miami and my family was in Miami. And so I came and I met with them and they said, listen, we know your heart isn't acting right now. So we're going to give you this special deal where you can do Deco, but you can still do acting on the side. And two to their word, you know, I did Deco for two years. I did a movie on the side. I did a commercial on the side. Wait, 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 wait. Slow down. Wait, wait. Yeah. So what movie did you do on the side? It was a show, a movie called The Suitor. It was, it was a movie that was produced for PBS. Uh -huh. And it was by a young filmmaker, uh, Juliana God. I can't remember her last name, but she was a beautiful filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, I played the love interest of the title character in the show, okay. in the movie. And um, and it was a beautiful, nice little 90 minute love story. And um, uh, anyway, um, that <laughs> begat another audition. And I was up for a major series in California. And my acting coach was like, well, if you really want to make this acting thing happen, you have to be in Los Angeles. So I quit Deco and I went to LA and I thought, okay, well, I've done Sex in the City. I did this movie. I did these commercials. I did these shows. All right, let's go. Let's make this happen. And sure enough, I got there and I didn't work. I didn't work for two years. I got my first role on a show called Jag and it was a guest star role. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a recurring role. It wasn't a, a series regular. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I just busted my ass for two years, taking all kinds of acting classes and going through all my money, going through all my savings. And here I am back at square one financially the same spot that I was when I graduated college, absolutely almost no money to my name. And again, my partner was still here in Miami. We were commuting back and forth. And I'm like, what do I want to do with my life? And sure enough, again, the forces of the universe opened up. And at that time, Lori Jennings, who was the main anchor of channel seven had left to do MSNBC and they promoted Belki Snare from <laughs> Deco anchor to the main anchor at SBN. And so my old boss, God bless her, Alice Jacobs, uh, one oh. of my the great forces in my life, uh, offered me the job to come back to Miami and do Deco. And I loved doing that show. And I came back to Miami. And, and that's when that show and the people who work on that show, the talent, the producers, the writers became my family. 
And I worked on that show for 11 years until I got off awesome. of this job. Yeah, that was awesome. and, it was, and it it really relaunched my career here in Miami and I had the best time doing it. And the best part about doing that show was shining a light, shining a spotlight on the wonderful things that we have going on in our backyard. And at that time, Miami was exploding. Our Basel had made its mark in Miami. Things were happening. Cultural centers were opening up. New museums were opening up. New restaurants, new venues, new hotels. And so that really fueled my passion. And I thought, well, this is what I want to do. Now I want to create a travel and lifestyle show. I don't really want to do the celebrity stuff anymore because I don't really, at that time, I, I didn't like the whole gossip direction of entertainment uh, television. Mm -hmm. It had gone from celebrating art to, you know, exploiting the mm -hmm. bad behaviors of artists and singers. And I didn't like that. I thought that was a very negative thing. Mm -hmm. Deco was kind of mindless because if we did a tongue in cheek, we weren't really that mean when we did it on Deco, but it was becoming very tabloid. -y. But what I really enjoyed doing was the hotels, the restaurants, the nightclubs. I said, I want to do this on an international scale. And so I got together with some of my uh, cameramen and producers and produced a pilot that we wanted to sell to the Travel Channel. It was called Louis List, where I would take you all over the world and show you the best places to stay, best places to eat, and the coolest things to do. I love all that. All these great cities all over the world. Yeah, and so we loved it too. <laughs> and so we went and we pitched the Travel Channel and uh, had, a mini, had a meeting with Discovery Channel. And um, and as this was was happening, I got offered this great opportunity to go to CBS and anchor a show called The Insider. So I was right back uh, <laughs> in this national spotlight doing an international, you know, doing an international show because actually it was from where? Sort of where, did you, countries. where did you do right? that from? Where did you do that in from? In Hollywood. I went back, I moved, I went, I, that's when I left Echo in 2014 and I went back to Hollywood and I did oh The God. Insider for three years. And I'm like, okay, well, this is great. So now I've got this platform where even though this is not really my show, because again, we're, we're dealing with entertainment news and, all that stuff that I was trying to get away from, but at least I have this platform now where more people know who I am and I could really launch the show that I want to launch. Um, and it didn't work out that way. And it was another humbling experience where you get to Hollywood and you think that all your dreams are just going to magically come true. And you realize that once you get there, the hustle has to happen even to a more extreme level and that you have to work even harder to keep that position. And I realized that I wasn't, even though I had my dream job, I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy with, I'll tell you what, this is, I, I love telling the story because my come to Jesus move, my come to Jesus moment was I had just turned 50 years old and my co-anchor that day was um, in New York uh, covering Oprah or something. And whenever that happened, we had a studio in New York, we had a studio in Los Angeles and we would do the show via satellite. But the lead story that day was um, out of Los Angeles. And because we were the sister show to Entertainment Tonight, Entertainment Tonight always took the top entertainment story of the day, and we got it was called the B story. Mm -hmm. And that day, there was a lot of controversy because apparently it was discovered that Kylie Jenner's lips were not real, that she had, in fact, injected her lips. Not that I kept up with the Kardashians. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan <laughs> of the brand. I never watched a single episode of that show. But that was my that was how we were leading the show that day. I had just turned 50 years old, and Good the copy show. was unlike. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Insider Breaking News. Kylie Jenner's lips real or not real and and apparently I could I, I couldn't I couldn't authentically deliver that with with enough passion that the producers and directors needed to be able to sell that story to lead the show that day and so they kept asking me to do the line over and over and over again more dramatic with more urgency and I remember just in my mind or in my in my soul my heart was shattering into a, a thousand oh, different man. pieces saying how I just turned 50 and I am on international, on worldwide television, you know, telling the people that they need to pay attention because we just discovered that Kylie Jenner's lips really aren't real. And oh my I'm goodness. Like, I, I, I can't, I, God, please kill me now. I just, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I can't do this anymore. And sure enough, three months later, that show was canceled. And I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? What's going to happen? And I remember the two most impactful moments I had on that show was when I was invited with, by Discovery Channel to go out and uh, and do Shark Week with them and go behind the scenes of Shark Week and oh. uh, learning how to scuba dive and going to Tahiti and going with Eli Roth and, you know, diving for the first time and coming face to face with a 17 foot tiger shark, no cage, and being surrounded by lemon sharks and reef sharks and completely overcoming my irrational fear of sharks and then learning how 
important and how vital they are to our ecosystem and how our oceans cannot survive without a healthy shark population. And I, mm-hmm. wow. And it changed my life and it became my passion. And I became this, this eco warrior and joined forces with the Cousteaus and uh, with Discovery and would share campaigns on social media. And sure enough, I, I, I became this homegrown environmentalist. And I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to tell important stories that are going to move the needle, that are going to inspire and educate all of us that we have to protect our planet. And that's the most important thing that we can do right now. And it's the most, it's the most important mission that we all have right now is to take care of our, our home. There is, no, there is no other planet. We have planet Earth. That's it. Bravo, um, bravo, and so bravo to that. When the show went away and... I didn't know where I was going to go, where I was going to, what was going to happen. You know, I get, I, I got offers from other entertainment shows. And I said, well, I didn't like what this was doing. So why would I want to do that? And so when Channel 10 came knocking on my door and they said, will you come home? Will you consider coming home to Channel 10? I said, yes, well, we have one condition. I said, what's that? I said, we don't want you to do entertainment anymore. We see you more as a journalist. We want you to do news. And I'm like, praise Jesus. Thank you very much. God bless you. <laughs> yes. Where do I sign? And so thank I came you. Back. Thank you. And they gave me this amazing opportunity. First of all, they, they hired me as an anchor, not knowing that my passion was environmental reporting. Right. And sure enough, I kept pitching these stories. I wanted, you know, my, my the first story that I wanted to pitch was a plan to retire Lolita from the Aquarium. This plan mm-hmm. almost been this smallest yeah. orchid tank for 52 years. It's inhumane what they're doing to this poor animal. Mm-hmm. And there was a plan to safely retire her. They created a sea pen for her uh, back in her natal waters uh, in, in the uh, Orca Islands in, in, uh, in Washington State, right near where she was captured. Um, and it seemed like a viable plan. And so they said, yeah, go do the story. And I did that story. And then that begot another story. And that begot another story. And sure enough, I, I, I realized that I was spending all of my time at Channel 10, yes, anchoring the news, but the stories that I were that I was pitching all had to do with saving and protecting our environment. And sure enough, here I am. Now I've got my own franchise on Channel 10. We're four months in called uh, Don't Trash Our Treasure. Uh, I just taped my, my, I just aired my 18th episode uh, yesterday and the reaction has been so tremendous and, and people are coming up to me more than, and I've done, I've been in this business for 30 some odd years. Mm-hmm. Never in the 30 some odd years that I've been doing television have I gotten such reaction from people that watch me every day coming up to me saying, thank you. I didn't know this. Oh my God, you opened my eyes. How do I get involved? And that to me is, is, is a sign from the universe that I am on track. I am living on purpose and that the ish is no longer an ish. The ish is a what is, and i have committed to that. I've surrendered to that. And now the world is opening up to me and I feel like I am driven i feel like i'm on purpose and i feel that i'm exactly where i need to be right now so boy that was a lot of words i'm sorry i just took up what wow. 10 minutes of your no. podcast and i you know i apologize I, for taking command of the conversation no. but this is why you know, you're here yeah I that's love that. that's my story in a nutshell that's that's so amazing louis you know i mean i have whiplash <laughs> <laughs> from all the places and all the things that you've done you're certainly not averse to change which is interesting because so many people some of the change has been forced and some was not right you know and i think so many people are averse to change but that's the law of the universe right nothing is constant everything must change it's a natural law winter turns to spring spring turns to summer summer turns to fall that's the natural cycle of life and you have it's when we are resistant to change that we suffer. Yes. We are resistant to evolution that we suffer. Yes. The human is meant to evolve the same way that the animal is meant to evolve, the, the same way that, that, that we have these natural cycles in, in life. Right. And what is true today isn't necessarily true tomorrow. I mean, there's a constant, obviously, but things change, things evolve, and you have to be willing to go with it. You know, there's a great saying that I love. One of my favorite sayings is, uh, God doesn't, you know, close the door without opening up a window. So look for right. the window. There's always a window. Sometimes there's more than one. Sometimes you get to choose. Isn't that fun, right? That's right. That's right. Or there's another open, there's another door. You just have to like, open. oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So doors and windows all around. But I think that's just, I think that's re- very powerful because I, I know people that are just so fearful of change and they, they, they kind of live in that place of, of fear. And I'm going, oh my God, you know, if you do that, you're really not experiencing a lot of the deliciousness of life <laughs> that's there, that potential for a whole different kind of living. 
So I love, I love hearing that story. I love seeing your dogs. So people that are listening to us are not seeing this. The people that are yeah. on YouTube are. Tell me about your dogs. I'm digressing so a moment. Chief, but... <laughs> this, is, this is Chief over here. He's, uh, the, when I came back to Miami after I, I left Los Angeles, uh, Good, we yes. had another Dalmatian that, that had passed away, sadly, right when I left for Los Angeles. So when I came back, I wanted to honor him and get another one, but I had been spending my, my time in Los Angeles advocating for a wonderful organization called Best Friends, oh, yeah. uh, which is one of the largest um, companion animal uh, organizations, rescue organizations in the world. And their mission is to stop the uh, euthanasia, the, uh, the killing of uh, companion animals and shelters by the year 2025. Mm. So I became a voice for them and I went to their sanctuary in Utah and Kanab, Utah and spent time just volunteering there and um, and helping with uh, the care of the animals. And I said, this is, this is what I want to do. And so when I came back and my partner and I, were, we want a second dog. I said, well, we have to rescue him. We can't, you know, even though you want a Dalmatian to honor them. We had two before. I said, we have to rescue one. And so I reached out to my friends at Dalmatian Rescue. And they had this little guy who was just four months old, whose family had thrown him away basically because they found out that he couldn't hear. He's deaf, he's hearing impaired, he can't hear a thing. Oh, wow. And so I didn't know how to take care of a deaf dog. But I'm like, okay. Uh, I'll learn. And we brought him and it was challenging for a few weeks. We got a trainer to teach us hand signals and to have taught us basically how to communicate with them. And he was the most wonderful dog in the world. So I, he's my, my deaf rescue. I love, I can't even, I don't even notice that you can't hear anymore. <laughs> he's very good with the science. Say if I just go like this. And his tail, for oh. those that are not watching, his tail yeah. doesn't stop wagging. <laughs> he's a very happy dog. They go oh. swimming. I live on Miami Beach. I it's a 10 minute walk to the, to the ocean every day. And so we start our day with a swim in the ocean. It's the and best way to start the day. They're so happy and they make me happy. That is so cool. And, and who's yeah. the other dog? Oh my the other God. dog is Riley. And she's another rescue. She's okay. a failed foster. Riley, come here, say hi. Good girl. She's sleeping. Um, That's okay. <laughs> she was found by coworkers of mine at Channel 7 uh, 12 years ago in uh, Florida City. She was found abandoned, a little scrawny little puppy. And uh, no one was stepping up. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll take this puppy home. But we all collectively, as a news organization, are going to find this dog. It's forever home. And I'm still fostering her 12 years later. So uh, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> she's my failed foster. I love this dog that you would not believe. I'm obsessed with her. That would but not she, be called uh, a foster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But she, she was great because uh, when I was in Los Angeles, Matt would, would fly with her. And, and so that I could have time with the dog and we would have um, time together. And so she's very well traveled and she stayed in very fancy hotels all California. We'd love to take her in the convertible and go and discover different parts of California. So she's been to the mountains, she's been to the desert, she's been to Laguna, she's been to California, uh, to San Francisco. The good life. Or this dog is very well traveled. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, I named her Riley because I wanted to give her the life of Riley. And I'm really oh my God, I love that. that. I, yeah. I love that. You know, you and I have so much in common um that you probably don't even don't even realize i worked in television for a very long time and the last you worked with my dear friend nancy ross uh well it was a tvj it was yeah. a wtvj yeah right and uh which was awesome you know we were cbs and then we were bought out by by nbc and that was kind of a very cool transition during that whole uh -huh. don't worry be happy campaign that we did and but the last thing i i I did was also something that became a passion for me. And that was called a matter of pride. I don't know if you were here during I remember that. I remember I remember the the, the campaign. I, and I that was that. that was one of the first, if not the first, uh environmental media campaigns in the country. We're talking in the 80s. And in, it was all about raising awareness of our precious environment and the very fragile environment. That we and I don't know why that went away. I remember growing up, we had the crying Indian and we had Woodsy the Owl and a matter of pride. And all of a sudden, well, there's been no public information campaign. This went public away. Public service. Uh, and we need one desperately right now. We need to remind I people know. what's at stake. And we need to remind people that they have to change the behaviors and that we cannot continue to consume the way that we're consuming right now. Yep. And litter. Litter is a huge problem. And I don't understand why in this day and age, people still litter. It makes me crazy. I spend my entire day picking up trash. Yeah. Honestly, I swear, yeah. Yeah. wherever I go. And it's not just on the beach, because I realize that whatever's on the street ends up in the storm drains, which empty out into our canals. And people have made the connection that I don't care how far you are away from land, I mean, from the water you are, whatever you throw out on the street ends up in the water. Yes. It's going to happen. 
Yeah. We have torrential rains here in Miami all the time. Yep. All the trash on the street, when it rains, goes into our stormwater system. That empties out into our canals. All of our canals, whenever the, the water gets high, empty out into the bay. That's why That's why the bay, the bottom of the bay, looks like a junkyard. I'm not kidding. It is, it is depressing. And we wonder why our bay is dying. It's we have to wake up. Hello. We really have to wake up. Yes, we do. See, you're passionate about it. I'm passionate about it. We need to talk. <laughs> yeah, well, let's keep talking. We'll, we'll, let's keep making noise. We're going to keep making noise because I've had an idea for many years. So maybe we can talk about that offline and that'll be uh, something okay. that, that we can do. Because I'm intrigued. I just, I just think that um, if people realize the effect of little things that, you know, even small things that you can do in your everyday life, even even simple things like you're brushing your teeth, turn off the water while mm -hmm. you brush, then turn it back on. Mm -hmm. Stupid little things like that have an impact. Mm -hmm. They add up. But then you get into the major stuff with with plastic and all that. And it's like, don't even get. Yeah, just it's becoming it's a conscious consumer and realizing that every choice that we make leaves a footprint. Right. Has so we can make better choices. Um, I now get for you talking about brushing your teeth. I research what is the most sustainable toothpaste out there. It's not a commercial. They don't pay me. There's a great toothpaste called David's Toothpaste, which is all natural. Um, and it comes in a metal tube that is completely recyclable. Unlike the toothpaste that you get in the at the, at the pharmacies, which I was going to say a name, a brand name. I didn't want to do that. No. Um, but this, this the tube that it comes in is completely recyclable. And uh, it, it has a better, it leaves a better uh, footprint on, on the environment as opposed to this plastic that's, you know, that it, it, it never goes anywhere. It stays on, on, on planet Earth. We've been uh, creating plastic products since the 1950s and every bit of plastic that's been created since the 1950s is still on the planet in some way, shape or form. Right now, there are 18 billion pounds of, of 18 billion tons of plastic that enter our, our environment every single year. It's not. We have. It's not sustainable. It's a. It's the equivalent of a garbage of a, of a garbage truck emptying out into our ocean every minute of the day. That's that's where we are. That's the level of consumption and plastic production is only expected to, to quadruple by 2050. It's gonna it's gonna triple by 2030. I mean, it's it's not sustainable. We have to make more conscious choices. We have to realize that everything we buy, everything we use, leaves an impact. You know so what? It's has time to wake up. You know what has that a huge impact are those little uh, coffee, plastic coffee. I'm not going to name a brand, but you know, you put in the machine and you. Oh, and yeah. You yeah down. Exactly. Those there's little no reason those, for that. Those are plastic. There's no, yeah, there's no reason for that. We, we can make better choices. You know, the coffee tastes better. You know, I've discovered because I love coffee it is my favorite way to make coffee is with an old fashioned coffee press. You know, I buy the, the coarse, I, I, I buy the beans and I, I, I drown them in a very coarse grind mm -hmm. and I put them on the bottom of the coffee press and you know it's the most delicious coffee in the world and it leaves no impact you know the, even the bag that I bring the grinds in is, is paper I love so that. it's about making these choices everything's like well, what can I do what kind of a, a of a change can I how do I modify my behavior as a consumer and make a much more compassionate choice yes. um, that will you know not adversely impact our environment and reduce the waste that we're producing is all of us. I mean, the population is growing. And so that's why we're in this mess right now is that we're producing more and more waste and we're running out of places to put it. Our landfills are filling up. Um, <laughs> only 7% of what we think is actually recycled is actually only 7%. You think about that statistic, only 7% of plastic that we recycle is actually recycled. That's so pretty then, scary. So explain that. What do you mean? I mean um, because, you know, it's it's uh, the recycling companies can only sell what is desirable in the market. And so we had these markets, uh, China and uh, the Southeast Asia that have stopped buying our recyclables here in the United States. So you have to find other markets for them. And it's the the plastic bottle, the plastic water bottle is is the most desired product to recycle. But the problem is, is that even that plastic bottle that's recycled is only recycled once. And then it becomes a, 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 a more a, a downgraded version of plastic that is then not recyclable. So we think we're recycling oh. it, but yeah, we are recycling it, but it only gets recycled once and then it becomes a cheaper form of plastic that's not recyclable. So that's why it's so important just to, just to reduce and, and, and refuse plastic right now and, and not think that recycling is going to solve this because we're not going to be able to recycle our way out of this problem. 
we we have to stop using plastic yes. or reinvent yes a plastic that is sustainable and yes. is and is compostable and, and we have great scientific minds at work right now trying to solve this issue um but right now the most important thing that we can do is just refuse it don't don't take a plastic bag if it's offered to you. Bring your your bag to the grocery right. store. If not, take a paper bag. Or I'm not carry. I've been known to carry my groceries in my arms because they didn't offer me a paper bag and all they have is plastic. I bring my bag with me. Uh, I've done that before. So it's it's being able to um, take responsibility for our behaviors as a consumer and realize what's at stake and be willing to make those modifications in our everyday life. I love that, Louis. Thank you for sharing that. And I did not know about the plastic bottle thing. I didn't yeah, know that. It's pretty yeah, scary. I, I feel really good that I'm recycling. I don't I don't do plastic water bottles, but you know, but you know, you feel really good that you're oh, I'm gonna recycle this. And it's like, yeah, just once and even, then even you know, even the, the laundry detergents, there's some recyclers that won't even accept color. It's it's much more difficult to recycle colored plastics. So you know your detergent bottles that come in green or orange. Yes or blue, they're not always accepted. So yeah, they are technically, just because something is technically recyclable, mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's actually recycled. So we have to- so we Just have reject to, it, reject yeah. it. Yeah, so there are different ways. There are, there are companies out there that are making um, sustainable packets for your laundry instead of buying the, the laundry yes. detergent in bulk like that. Yes. And there's also a service that actually comes and gives you refillable containers and they come to your house and they actually, um, refill your containers with the actual product. So you're not buying the container, you're just buying the product. When you come to your house, you leave your containers out on the, on the front door of the, the stoop. And whenever you're not home, the truck comes in and, the, and, and it refills your containers and you don't have to go to the grocery store and keep buying more and more and more plastic because not all of that's been recycled. I love that, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah. such, a, such a passion for me as well. This has, been so, this has been so great, you know, and I think this gives people an opportunity to, to get to know you also more than maybe they might by seeing you anchor or report or act, yeah. right? This is, this is the real person that I just think is such an awesome guy. <laughs> oh, good up. All right back at you. So t let's, let's finish this off with like, um, to inspire people, to inspire someone going back to like the ish, you know, where you had all these different things and you, you kept moving from one thing to another to then finally discover this passion, you know, any little, you know, gems that you can share with yes. someone else? Yes, uh, find your spiritual life, whatever that means to you, because I found my path through my spirituality. And I don't mean religion, mm -hmm. um, even though I was raised Catholic and I love my religion and, and uh, but my spiritual life is 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 independent of my religion. Uh, the religion gave me the thesis, it gave me the background, but my spiritual life is something that I cultivated on, on my own. And it was a journey that I went on and discovered on my own. Um, and for me, that means um, mindfulness and, and, uh, and cultivating that every single day. I practice meditation. On a good day, I do it twice a day, but I wake up the first thing I do in the morning before I pick up my phone, before I take my dogs to the beach is I meditate for 25 minutes every day, every morning. I, I studied with a teacher in Los Angeles who taught me uh, TM, Transcendental Meditation. And uh, my practice has evolved over the years. I've been doing this now for uh, 14 years wow. and it's changed my life. It is completely, um, help me avoid the rat you know when we go to we go we go down that rabbit hole we start to think of all the negative things um if something happens to us we think of all the worst possible scenarios and all of a sudden that's it zoom and gloom my life is over my job is over my relationship is over so what meditation does for you is it allows you to start every moment with a clean slate so whatever storm you had to endure the day before when you wake up the next morning and you meditate it's like taking a giant eraser on the chalkboard that is your life and starting fresh from ground zero and being able to build a brand new narrative and build uh -oh, someone's here. Um, so that's been key in helping me navigate all the changes that have come through my life. Uh, if I didn't have that practice, I think it would have been pretty scary, right? It's because change is scary. But when you have that practice and you realize that you are one with the universe and that the universe is your friend and the universe has the universe has your back you realize okay i'm going to surrender it's okay if i allow myself to surrender 
a path will illuminate. I'll know in which direction I'm, I'm going to go. So uh, that to me has been the most important tool I have in my bag of tricks to help me navigate the changes that life has, has brought me. I love that. Can I end this with a, something that I just found today? That sure. Was just sent my way. You know how that happens and things happen for a reason. So I like to, I get the, the daily ohm. And today, I mean, I knew I would be speaking with you and, and sort of a little bit of what we were talking about. And today's ohm is your life's work. Each of us has been blessed with a purpose that makes our hearts sing. Many are committed to professions and personal endeavors they never consciously planned to pursue. They mm -hmm. attribute the shape of their lives to circumstances, taking on roles they feel are tolerable. Each of us, however, has been blessed with a purpose. Your life's work is the assemblage of activities that allows you to express your intelligence and creativity, live in compliance with your values, and experience the profound joy of simply being yourself. Unlike traditional work, which, many de which may demand more of you than you are willing to give, life work demands nothing but your intent and passion for that work. Yet no one is born with an understanding of the scope of their purpose. If you have drifted through life, you may feel directionless. Striving to discover your life's work can help you realize your true potential and live a more authentic, driven life. 100%. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's it in a nutshell. That's so beautifully written. I love that daily own. I'm going to post that on the uh, website. That's um, beautiful. What the ish podcast.com yeah. near, uh, near your interview. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's it right there. Thank you so, so, so much for joining us today. I love, I love, I love the person that you are on and off camera. Uh, thank you. Well, it's what you see is what you get. I, what, who I am on camera is who I am off camera. So I try to make that uh, as authentic as possible. So I hope that comes through. That's a beautiful thing. Have a blessed day, Louis. You too. God bless you. Nice talking to you, Pat. You too, sweetie. You take, <laughs> take care. care. Bye. Bye.